here for those of you who for those of you um, who have not met me, my name is Aurora San Pedro, um, Maria Aurora San Pedro, but I go by Aurora. Um, I am one of the mental health providers that are uh, available on campus. And so um, I am specific to the mental health grant. So uh, a lot of what I've been doing since I've been at Mesa is kind of bulking up the mental health um, events uh you know working on things that are behind the scenes as well with um <clears throat> excuse me um like you know um changing things from electronic re health records especially during this pandemic um with mimi who's the expert on all of these things that happened during the pandemic so i'm really grateful for mimi uh, but doing a lot of the behind the scenes stuff as well with um trying to get access to different groups and um, kind of doing a lot of the events mainly. Um, and then I also see students. Um, I pop into classrooms as well. Um, so a lot of personal growth classes I pop into, share little mental health presentations, as well as provide support to staff and faculty like this and providing support uh, on mental health because not only have our students struggled throughout the last year or so, um, so have we. And so that's why I'm here today to kind of go over why mental health matters, um, maybe just clarify some of the things that um, may, may need clarification on mental health, um, or just questions you might have about um, maybe your own struggles or people that you see or students that you're experiencing that are, are struggling and how to support them. All right, so just a brief screenshot here of what we're going to be doing. Um, I'm going to give you a quick introduction on mental health, kind of the difference between mental health and mental illness. Um, do a quick check-in, um, go over parts of the brain and kind of what happens to our brains as we are um, experiencing emotional distress or our mental health is off its baseline. Um, I'll also describe a little bit about, um, I'll play some videos. Um, Something that's really helpful is to have visuals. So I'll also play some videos for all of you. Um, I will also go over doom scrolling. That tends to be a new thing that's been not really new, actually, I take that back. It's just something that's existed, but has been heightened since the pandemic. Um, and then I'll go over self-care and, and how to stay connected to others. Um, let's see. <clears throat> I'm going to check out the chat. Okay, just making sure I don't have questions. All right. So, um, so giving you a quick introduction on what mental health is. And so the World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own uh, potential can cope with the normal um, stressors of life, um, can work productively and fruitfully, and ca can contribute to his or her own community. Um, that's kind of what mental health is. So really being able to uh, manage some of the things that are, are happening in life or the things outside of our lives, in our community, giving back, things like that. Um, when our mental health is struggling, um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have a mental illness, but you could be struggling with your mental health, which all of us on a normal uh, level struggle with mental health. Some of us might be diagnosed with mental illness, and I'll go into that in further detail in a few minutes, but um, I know there's new terms that are being thrown out to just make it less confusing uh, to distinguish between mental health and mental illness. So some of the terms that are Kind of being thrown out there are positive mental health, mental health, or mental well being, uh, um, subjective well being. So they're kind of switching around the verbiage uh, to help um, kind of distinguish the difference there. Um, with mental illness, um, really what that is, is it's mental illness refers to a wide range of disorders that affect mood, thinking, and behavior. Mental illness can um, can affect everyone, uh, regardless of your age, your gender, your social um, um, standing, religion, race. It doesn't matter. It, just, it does not discriminate. So people with mental illness um, often experience distress and problems functioning at work, home, 
and social situations. And but just kind of, just so you're aware, as I'm doing um, my clinical assessments, when I do an intake session, I'm really looking at those things. What, you know, what level of functioning does this person have? Are they able to get to work? Are they able to go to school? Are they able to um, socialize? Those aspects really help um, with the diagnoses of mental illness. So um, going in a little bit further here, um, sometimes there's a biological factor. If maybe you've experienced trauma or um, you know someone who's experienced trauma, maybe brain chemistry, um, abuse, family history of, a, of mental illness, that all impacts um, mental illness. Um, and typically we, oh, sorry. Um, typically uh, we use the DSM-5, which is um, a, a huge book of different diagnoses and criteria to meet those diagnoses. All right, so I'm gonna do a quick check-in. You can use your smartphones to pop up this QR code, or you can just go to slido.com and then put in that code right there, 874060. Either which one will work. So if you just pop up your camera, put the QR code, it should lead you to the question that I have here, which is um, using one word, describe your current mood. So today's current mood. And as you all are doing that, I'm gonna see your words pop up. And once I get a few answers in, I'll share, I'll share the results with everyone. And it's anonymous, so I won't see, no one will see your answers or um, your word that you're using. We'll just see, or who is, whose word it is. We'll just see a, a, a cloud. It's called a word, a word cloud. So I'll give a few minutes for that. I'm gonna to check to see if I have some um, answers here. I got about 14 answers. If you haven't already or might be confused on how to do it, um, again, it's on the screen there. Just pull up the QR code or type in the. Okay. I'll wait for maybe one more minute for any last minute uh, word descriptions. Okay. I'm gonna share the results and share a different screen. I don't know if I'm doing this right, but this is what I know. <laughs> All right, so here's our word cloud. We have um, a little tired, mellow, okay, happy, anxious, a little off, resigned, stressed, Overwhelm. Um, good thing we're going to be talking about overwhelm. So that's good. Tired, content. So if we could see here the answers we're getting, we get, uh, you know, when I do this, oftentimes I do get a mix kind of a 50 50, which I'm getting a sense here too. Um, I can relate to tired. I definitely can relate to um, being mellow too. Uh, but it just depends on the day, right? Um, and that's the thing about mental health and mental illness is sometimes some days are harder, some days are easier. Um, it just depends. And so accessing 
the things that can help us get out of the overwhelm or the stress or uh, feeling drained are the things that are essential. And so I'm going to go over that um, a little bit further today. Okay. So that's our little word cloud. Thank you for participating in that. back to sharing this screen here. All right. So now I'm going to go into <clears throat> a little bit about how the brain functions. And so I'm not going to go into too much detail because we're going to watch a video on this. But um, there's three parts of, of the brain. And if you hold up your hand like a fist, like this picture right here to the left, um, this is the, your, your, the part of your wrist is what, what would be representative of your spinal, spinal cord. The top there is called your cerebral cortex and that's part of your brain. It's called the upstairs part of your brain. And that's where we make um, our sound decisions, our planning, um, control of our emotions and body. Um, that's where we have self-understanding and empathy. Um, and we also have a downstairs brain and our upstairs and downstairs brain, they're always working together and they're communicating. So when we, they are not communicating, um, what happens is uh, this concept called flip, flip your lid. So if you look over to the right side, you see um, a hand being held up with four fingers and then your thumb. That's kind of what happens when you flip your lid. So when your um, upstairs brain and downstairs brain are not communicating, you flip your lid. Um, and sometimes um, our hope, well, at least sometimes we can almost get to halfway where we're not all the way flipped over. So that's our hope is to just stay right on the halfway mark before we flip our lid. And so that's where the coping skills and all of the um, things that are helpful when you, you um, you know, researching, reading books or uh, seeing a therapist, those things are helpful to implement to not get you to flip your lid. And I know, myself included, during this pandemic, I definitely have flipped my lid quite a few times, um, especially having kids at home. Um, that was really a difficult transition for me of how, what am I going to do, you know, working at home, trying to do my sessions, trying to do presentations. Uh, thankfully, things have opened up slowly. My kids are part-time back in school and things like that. So that's been helpful, but that might not be circumstances for other people. And so I will go over a little bit on, on how to manage that. Okay. Um, so I do want to go over a little bit on that thumb region. So the, the limbic region, which is limbic system, where the thumb is, is where our amygdala and our hippocampus is. And that is where um, our flight, fight, or freeze response is. If you all have heard of that before, that's where it occurs. So, um, you know, our stress responses. So our limbic system is in charge of that. And some of you may have heard these words before, the amygdala, hippocampus and stuff like that. And that's where mental health um, discussions are really talked about there. So I will go over um, to the next slide to give you more of a, a video um, on that. And Russ Harris, who is an amazing expert in the world of mental health, he is an expert in ACT therapy. So um, it's ACT, it's spelled that way. Um, it's called Accept and Commit Therapy. And um, I'm trained in this and I have gravitated towards this modality of treatment just because it really sits with, with my, um, my style of therapy, uh, the, the way that I feel a lot of people um, function. And so I'm gonna share most of his videos today just because I think he gives a lot of good visuals. So I'm gonna play that. Um, will you just confirm if you could hear? I, I already optimized this out, just wanna make sure you all can hear it. Um, you can give me a little thumbs up, okay? Now you probably know the name Dan Siegel. He's one of the 
Now, you probably know the name Dan Siegel. He's one of the giants in the field of interpersonal neurobiology. And Dan came up with a lovely hand model of the human brain. So let's kind of go through the hand model of the brain. And this can be useful for you to understand, but at times it might be useful for you to actually share this with your client. The wrist, the forearm coming up to here is like your spinal cord. And right here at the, uh, the end of the wrist is like the base of your skull. And here, the bottom of your palm, this is like the reptile brain, the life support system of the brain. So, you know, if the rest of your brain is wiped out through, say, for example, a stroke or a car accident, this life support part of your brain, the reptile brain, can still keep your body alive, can still keep all your organs functioning and your breath and your heart and so forth. And this is where a lot of autonomic nervous system operates and stems from this reptile brain. Now, above the reptile brain is the mammalian brain, often called the limbic brain or the emotional brain. So reptiles, they've got the fight or flight response or they've got the freeze, shut down, flop and drop response, but they don't really have anything that is even remotely close to the, the complex emotional states that we see in mammals. And the limbic brain has many different parts to it, but two in particular that we'll be looking at in this course are the amygdala and the hippocampus. Now, don't worry about memorizing those terms for now. We will revisit them later. But this kind of is the, the middle brain, the limbic brain, the mammalian brain, basically responsible for emotions. Now, on top of the limbic mammalian emotional brain, you've got the cerebral cortex, the thinking cap of the brain. The cerebral cortex is much thicker in mammals, but especially so in primates, and particularly so in human beings, more so than any other primate. And this cerebral cortex, the thinking part of the brain responsible for consciousness and cognition. And right at the front of the cerebral cortex, you have the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's right up here at the front of your forehead, above your eyes. And particularly important to us is the medial prefrontal cortex, this bit in the middle right at the front, this bit up here. This plays a very important role in mindfulness and awareness. So let's just go through it again. You've got your spinal cord, you've got your reptile brain. Underneath your cerebral cortex, you've got your mammalian brain with the amygdala, the hippocampus, responsible for emotions. And then you've got your cerebral cortex, your thinking cap of the brain on top and the medial prefrontal cortex right here in the center at the front right there. Okay so um, I just included another quick example of what flipping your lid um, looks like here um, but why I think this is important is we have to kind of know what goes on in our brain and how it works to actually be able to figure out what do we do with it, right? Because um, sometimes, oftentimes actually in, in sessions with people, I hear like, why is my life so hard? Why is life this, this way, right? Um, but knowing these factors and the things that um, uh, contribute to our functionality is important because then we understand it from a different perspective. And so this um, visual here is kind of the same concepts. Um, uh, use, so when you look at your hand, you can kind of think about your brain a little bit there. Um, so when you lose uh, access to your prefrontal cortex, uh, your thinking brain, um, uh, your amygdala um, is activated. So your fight, fight, or freeze uh, response is there. Uh, but parts of your brain um, work in harmony. And so what's helpful about that is when you need to induce calm or you need to learn balance or you learn how to relax, you can also teach your brain to do that as well. So yes, it might stress out, but there's also ways they can learn to navigate and get halfway instead of flipping your lid. And so it leads me to defining overwhelm because that's what's happening to our brains while we're overwhelmed, right? And so uh, emotional overwhelm entails more than being stressed. Um, you can uh, feel submerged in life's current problems um, to the point where you lack efficacy and feel frozen or paralyzed. And so 
the example used here uh, that might be helpful is think about when you're at the beach and there's these rough waves that are crashing down. And, you you know, as a kid, I remember trying to jump over these huge waves and then toppling over and then just feeling like, oh, my gosh, where am I going? I have to grab onto something. What way do I swim? And so that kind of tends to be a good analogy about what happens when we're stressed and overwhelmed. It's like, where do I even start? How do I get up from feeling like I'm drowning? Um, you know, who's going to help be my buoy and get me out of this, right? So that's kind of what happens um, when we're feeling overwhelmed is that tends to, things tend to pull us down. We feel as if we're um, uh, not able to swim in the right direction. And so um, things like a global pandemic or, um, you know, trying to adjust to work-life balance or wearing different caps in your home um, obviously can increase that level of overwhelm and can activate um, our uh, amygdala and our flight, flight or freeze responses. Okay, and so um, with that being said, uh, I have another video which is going to help describe how to um, um, manage some of these things. So I'm going to give you a quick um, idea on some solutions on how to reduce your overwhelm. And this was very specific to um, COVID. Um, when COVID started, you know, first kind of uh, came, uh, occurred, and it started really taking over, um, everyone's mental uh, health had been, um, you know, really heightened. Um, Russ Harris came up with something called face COVID, and I can attach this into the chat, but this is not just applicable during COVID. This is very helpful day in and day out for anybody that experiences overwhelm. Um, so I'm going to play this so you can get some ideas. You feel free to take notes and I will make sure to include in the chat the, the little handout on, on this acronym face COVID. When we face a crisis of any sort, fear and anxiety are inevitable. They are normal natural responses to any challenging situation infused with danger and uncertainty. Face COVID is a set of practical steps for dealing with such situations. F is for focus on what's in your control. You can't control what happens in the future. You can't control coronavirus itself or the world economy or what other people do. And you can't magically control your thoughts and feelings. Fear, anxiety and worry are inevitable. But you can control what you do here and now. So let's focus on that. A is for acknowledge your thoughts and feelings. Silently and kindly acknowledge whatever is showing up inside you. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, sensations, urges. With curiosity, Notice what's going on in your inner world. You might say to yourself, I am noticing feelings of anxiety, or I'm having thoughts about getting sick, or I'm having feelings of loneliness. And as you continue acknowledging your thoughts and feelings, bring in the next step, which is C, come back into your body. Find your own way of connecting with your physical body. For example, you might try slowly pressing your feet hard into the floor, or slowly pressing your fingertips together, slowly stretching your arms or your neck or shrugging your shoulders, or slowly breathing. And as you acknowledge your thoughts and feelings and come back into your body, you then move to E, which is for engage in what you're doing. Get a sense of where you are here and now, and refocus your attention on the activity at hand. Notice five things you can see, five things you can hear. Notice what you can touch and taste and smell. Notice what you are doing and give your full attention to that activity. And then C is for committed action. This means effective action guided by your core values. Action you take because it's important to you, even if it brings up difficult thoughts and feelings. 
Of course, this includes following official guidelines on what to do during this crisis. But in addition, ask yourself regularly, what can I do right now, no matter how small it may be, that improves life for myself or others I live with or people in my community? And whatever the answer is, do it and engage in it fully. O is for opening up. This means making room for difficult feelings and being kind to yourself. As this crisis unfolds, we'll all feel fear, anxiety, anger, sadness, guilt, loneliness, and so on. We can't stop these painful feelings from arising, but we can open up and make room for them. Acknowledge they are normal, allow them to be there even though they hurt, and treat ourselves kindly. Consider what are kind words you can say to yourself, and kind things you can do for yourself to help you cope with this suffering. V is for values. Committed actions should be guided by your core values. What do you want to stand for in the face of this crisis? What sort of person do you want to be as you go through this? How do you want to treat yourself and others? Your values might include love, respect, humor, patience, courage, honesty, caring, openness, kindness, compassion, or numerous others. Look for ways to sprinkle your values into your day and let them guide and motivate your actions. I is for identify resources. Identify resources for help, assistance, support, and advice. This includes friends, family, neighbors, health professionals, and emergency services. Make sure you know the emergency helpline phone numbers, including those for psychological help if required. D is for disinfect and distance. Remember to disinfect regularly and practice physical distancing for the greater good of your community. Please run through the steps of face COVID as often as you can for the benefit of yourself, your loved ones, and all the people in your community. Okay, so I've attached that um, handout, uh, the infographic for this uh, face COVID acronym, because all of these are not things that are new because of COVID. They're things that are, um, have always been important, but people have lost touch with or felt, um, you know, a difference. In, obviously, we all have felt a difference in, in the way that we've communicated with people. Um, but I still am sensing a sense of hesitancy for some of my clients that I'm experiencing uh, or, you know, seeing right now with um, just fears of getting back to normal even. And so all of this is still important even as we get back into our, our um, normal interactions with others. Any questions or comments on that? Okay. All right, so I'm, that segues me into uh, doom scrolling. Um, as this is not a new concept, as I've shared with you all before. Uh, really, it's it's a habit that's increased because of 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 the the nature of the world and, and the things that happened within the last year. Um, I think the main thing here is, uh, you know, when we're doom scrolling, it tends to be, um, you know, we're on our phones for a long period of time, and then it leads us to bad news, it leads us to negative posts, um, and because it's so habitual for us to grab our phones um, and then go from post to post or whatnot, it it we don't even connect to our minds and bodies on how it's even impacting us. And so um, it kind of gets us stuck in those, those patterns. Um, and so I know that it is very habitual to say, oh my gosh, did you hear this happened? And then you want more information. So you grab your phone, you Google it. 
and then you look on social media and what people are posting on it, it tends to be the first thing that we, we, we move towards to get information. And so obviously I remember in the very beginning when COVID hit um, and, and it was really, really getting huge. Um, I remember um, checking the county website on like the numbers in like in San Diego, in my area, and just feeling like I had to keep checking it and things like that um, as the numbers rose. I mean, with all the, um, the political bad behavior, um, you know, all of these different crimes happening, all of that was an easy way to get into that doom scrolling um, habit. And so um, what do we do about it? How does it impact our mental health? I will go over what to do um, to avoid that tendency, um, but I do want to go over how it impacts our mental health. So a few things that um, happen is it reinforces negative thoughts and, and feelings, um, you know, when we are kind of feeding into the doom scrolling, um, it can trigger mental illness. And so, uh, you know, the tendency to um, maybe be, let's just say you're on your bed, you, you can't sleep, and you're kind of doing the doom scrolling and um, you realize it's two o'clock and you're like, oh my gosh, I need to sleep. And then you wake up, and you just don't have any motivation to do anything. May, may have triggered your anxiety, may have triggered uh, some depression. So all of that can happen as a result. Um, increased panic and worries. I know that that happened quite a bit in the very beginning as well, where uh, if you all remember everyone looking for toilet paper, right? Like. And, and really stockpiling on things during um, during the beginning of COVID. And so that increases panic and worry because we see it on social media, we see it on the news. And, and so people are just rushing to, to do what everyone's doing. Um, other things, uh, and, and I know that this was something that I had a few clients share with me was, I see all these people like going out and hanging out now and I know people are vaccinated, which is great. I just still feel really scared. I don't know if I'm going to be able to be social anymore and, you know, things of that nature. So doom drilling, when you're on social media, seeing people do things, it might trigger those feelings inside. Like, man, why can't I do that? Like my anxiety is so bad. I can't even hang out with people and um, all of that. So just being very mindful of how long you've been on the, um, the devices or things like that is very, very important. And then that requires intentionality behind when you grab your phone and things like that. Um, so the more cortisol and um, adrenal um, are released into your brain and your body. And so that can lead to obviously more stress with your mental health and um, your physical health. And I'm going to give you some top three tips. So these are the three that I think are most uh, important when you're trying to combat and reduce uh, doom scro scrolling. Um, the first one I put um, is actually, a, it's a therapy technique I use uh, for people that um, constantly are anxious. And so uh, it sounds silly, but set time limits and timers. Um, to almost schedule yourself to worry or to look up stuff um, or, um, you know, just recognizing how long you've been on your device is a very intentional thing to do uh, because we can easily, I don't know, I mean, I'm being completely honest that I've done that and I realize it's two o'clock and I haven't slept and I'm like, this is really bad, <laughs> right? And yes. so, um can anyone chime in and I hear some comments. Was there someone that was going to make a comment? I want to give you time. I think I did that. Like I noticing, um, I cannot be detached because from the morning when you start remotely, you're on the computer and then you get in off and then you have some personal work you need to do. Again, it's going to be on the computer or on the phone. So I see myself literally from the morning to exactly, even the like our, my relaxing time, I find myself, okay, I'm either want to watch something or 
on the social media. So again, you are on the like on the phone or on the device. So as a result, yes, I see most of the time I am con like constantly anxious and worried that I forgot something. Do I need to do anything? Do I need to check my email? Do I maybe like like I feel if I'm not on it, like I forgot to do something. So that's the that's the worst thing. Like I don't know how it was before. Like if we were not on the phone or on the computer to work in. And be kind of like yeah, re- relaxing is kind of like you don't know what to do with yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's been one of the results of being at home. And I think there's a lot of gratitude to have about the being able to be in the comfort of your own home and work. Uh, but I also know there's there's always a negative and positive to, to different perspectives. And I, I appreciate your honesty on that because I think about like, okay, I'm going to take a break. And so let's just say you step away from your computer and then you grab your phone and then you're like, I'm going to watch this YouTube video, right? There's not really, really that time away from an electronic device for you to be present in the moment that you truly are in or that you need to recharge. I mean, I, you know, for private practice, I would see clients back to back, like eight clients a day. And I'm not, advocating for that because that's definitely not I'm steering away from that now mental health has boomed obviously during this pandemic but what I would notice is when I was done with at the end of the day and I didn't take a break or step outside my brain was shot I was so exhausted I was irritable towards everybody around me it was just not a good thing and so being very intentional even with the breaks I have in between to step outside having the luxury of being able to step outside um, in your home uh, is so important. I think we feel like um, she had mentioned, I'm sorry, I didn't see your name. Can you tell me your name again? Mona. Mona. So with that being said, I think she hit the nail on the head, it's like feeling like we're constantly missing something because we've created a habit. And so that's kind of what I, I, I think is important to take out of anything here today is like, habits are made and broken and they can I think it's like 21 I think research says actually 30 or something to to make or break a habit um so think about if we started to be more intentional with the way that we use our devices how could we create more healthier habits right Uh, how does our brain start learning um the things that we need for ourselves because that's just been the nature of what we've consumed ourselves with just like riding a bike like if you you know want to learn how to ride a bike you're going to have to keep riding it over and over you're not going to just you know uh jump on it and you fall and then expect to okay I got it you know so things need to be repeated in order for us to learn and have it become a habit um so that kind of leads me to uh the next thing here so setting a timer Um, And then keeping the phone out of the bedroom. And this is very hard for everyone. I feel like everyone has a nightstand that they just plug in and put their phone right next to them. So as soon as it's time to wake up, the alarm goes off, you grab it, right? Which is totally fine that you need to keep in your room. I would just encourage you to put it opposite side of your nightstand or where your bed is. That has helped me immensely um, charging my phone somewhere else where I could still hear it from my alarm, but I'm not tempted at 2 a.m. when I had to use the bathroom to go to the restroom and then go back to bed. And I'm like, gosh, I can't sleep. And then I grab my phone. I check my email. I'm like doing all these. I'm like, what is the point, right? Like I'm just allowing more um, for my brain to be more awake. Um, So I think that is a good, one of the good top tips here. I'm going to see if I can read a little bit here. Yeah, absolutely, Ruth. Absolutely. Uh, That's really good. I love, Ruth, that you said that you're trying to be more intentional with taking walks and runs in your neighborhood. 
that in itself is already a good way of, of I'm going to go into self care. So we could talk about that further. But thank you for your honesty. I think a lot of people, if you are a parent, or if you're caring for someone else, um, like a parent, uh, or an elder or a family member, that tends to be um, another layer of stress, because you're blending your hats, as I've told you, I think, for those of you who were at my presentation last year talking about mental health, we definitely talked about that and how like, wow, this transition of like all of a sudden we're blended with uh, the roles that we're, um, we're supposed to be we wearing basically or putting on in those moments all at once. So I completely understand that's difficult. Um, that's good. Rocio, the... Um, I can never keep my phone. I know. Oh, I thought you had said something different. Yeah, it's so hard because, I mean, I have my phone right next to me. It's like, we feel like we're bare without it. And it's because it is a habit. Um, I put my phone on silent as a rule. That's a really good one, Melissa. Yeah. Go for a short drive. Me, it's just to go away from my phone or speak mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's so true, um, Eva. Uh, having your phone as your source of communication, of the way that you feel connected to people. Absolutely. So it feels as if, like, oh my gosh, am I going to miss out on any communication that I feel is important to me? Um, and so how do you create balance behind that, right? A balanced thought behind that is um, a 30 minute walk without um, having to look at my phone. Um, I think you could set like settings on your phone where it's like a do not disturb or something like that. So you're not getting alerts that might be helpful. Um, and I think some of the settings allow you to um, at least just get a call from like your emergency or your favorites list. So if you're not, if there was an emergency, you wouldn't, you'd still get the call or the, the communication. Um, but I think the main thing is, is how do you say out of form of self-respect, right? I'm going to put my phone on silent or I'm going to put it on do not disturb for the next 30 minutes while I just go or 10 minutes as I stroll around the neighborhood or as I just do some deep breathing while I step outside. Short drives seem to be helping people. That's great. I have one comment. If I want to share. Sure. Um, sure. I'm one of the guilty one that I feel I cannot disconnect from the phone, even like my mm -hmm. relaxing time, which is on the phone, social media or something. But recently, what I what I do, I think that's kind of like forced me to not even look to it. Mm -hmm. I go at nighttime, I, like a, after five or six, to the pool, um, um, like to exercise in, in the pool, that's the only way that you cannot have even your phone like in the water with right. you. And I right. felt so relaxing because like when, I don't know if anybody experienced that when you go under the water that like you, you don't hear anything, no sounds or anything. Like mm -hmm. you isolate, I feel like, oh my God, I feel like released, like yeah. not yeah. being connected to anywhere. And it was amazing right. to feel that way. Yeah, that's such a good point. And, um, you know, now that the weather is getting a little warmer, you have access to going outdoors and being in the water. That is a really good coping skill. Um, and I think Trevor mentioned here, I like doing activities that force me not to engage on my phone, like running, surfing, climbing. All of those are really, really great. Um, because I think the disconnect to our devices helps us connect to ourselves, if that makes sense. So how do you reconnect to yourself so you know what you're needing? Because as I, in some of the videos that I shared and things that we've discussed today, a lot of the topics um, is being mindful. And that goes into the next thing I'm gonna discuss here is apply mindfulness in, to uh, scroll scrolling. And mindfulness tends to be a little bit of buzzword right now, which is great. Um, but also sometimes used incorrectly. So when you think of mindfulness in the sense of psychology uh, and research with psychology, it's the act of being present, 
Um, so it doesn't, you know, even this picture is kind of um, a little bit deceiving here is like, you know, she's kind of trying to zen out and, and be focused, which is all very helpful because that is a form of mindfulness is to meditate. But that um, the idea of achieving calm or achieving um, zen or relaxation is not the purpose of mindfulness. Mindfulness is to be very present and cautious about what you're doing in that moment, be present. And so when you are, for example, on the phone, say you habitually grabbed it because you can't sleep. And then you, you notice what's happening to your feelings and emotions. Like I'm just feeling tired physically of oh, that post made me so annoyed. Oh, I'm gosh, why are people posting this stuff that in itself? Okay. I'm noticing I'm getting irritable about my time on my phone. I'm going to put it down. Right. So being very intentional and mindful of the way that you're interacting with the things that you're looking at viewing um, can impact the way you move. You know, but did I have somebody comment or? Okay, let me catch up on some of these messages here. Oh, yes. Massage therapy, confusion dancing. Absolutely. Short drive. Driving seems to be helping people. I've heard that quite a bit. watch the sunset you know during the pandemic what something um that we did in the beginning was we drive to the beach and then just pop open the trunk we'd like make sandwiches or like bring food and then we'd just eat dinner at the trunk of our car and just hang out that way it was really nice okay let's see i tried not checking my phone first hour of my week. that's really great alexi I actually read on that a bit and I think it's, it's a challenge and I will challenge all of you for the first 30 minutes of your day. Even if you just turn off your alarm, don't open it right for the first 30 minutes of the start of your day, try to avoid social media, try to avoid pulling up a text, just focus on getting up in the morning, washing your face, brushing your teeth, getting ready maybe even having your breakfast without looking on your, on your phone. And then, and then notice what that does. If it makes you feel more rejuvenated, if it makes you feel more connected to yourself, maybe you're even going to be more productive for the day. Awesome. Right. So I challenge you to do that. I think that's a really great tip. Let's see if the first hour of your day, that's amazing. That's a long period of time too. All right just sitting in the water absolutely you guys are sharing such great ideas here so i know we have a, a few minutes here 10 minutes i want to go over my tips for self-care which some of you already are hitting the nail on the head with some of this and you kind of jump you know um beat me to the punch here with uh, about you know having people that you have to take care of at home whether it's kids parents family members maybe even feeling lonely. So if you don't have anybody at home, what are things that you live alone? What are things that you could do for yourself to take care of you, to um, uh, be more intentional uh, outside of being stuck on a computer or being on your phone? Um, some of you already hit the nail on the head here with spending time in nature. Um, studies have found that, um, you know, spending time in nature is really good for your psychological health. Um, I think there was a research study done in a hospital that people that had views uh, or had a window and had, had access to looking outside healed faster uh, than people that didn't have like a view or um, had like uh, a scenery to look at. Um, so a quick walk to the park, many of you have talked about walking dogs, that's very helpful. So pet therapy is amazing. Um, hikes, trails, um, gardening. So if you don't like going on big adventures out, you know, in the community, if you have your own plants, which plants are like huge right now, like being a plant parent, basically to take care of that can be very relaxing, um, and, and restful. So implementing that time in nature. Um, exercise, many of you had said that in the chat earlier that um, you, you go out running or you go on a walk. Those in itself are 
very uh, profoundly impactful on um, being able to manage depression, anxiety, ADHD, uh, relieving your stress, all of that. So um, 30 minutes, I, I, just like I said, with the phone, 30 minutes of your day to exercise, even if that's a brisk walk or just, um, you know, a yoga video that you find on YouTube, you could do that. Um, or just something that you remember from class, just something that connects you to your body um, is so important. Um, Pre-planning time alone. So um, some of you have expressed that your parent, that you're a parent or, or are parents. Um, and then some of you have expressed maybe that you are, um, are maybe living alone and have no roommates. So these are things that you can pre-plan. How do you plan, uh, you know, hanging out with yourself, doing something that you enjoy by yourself? So if uh, I think it was Ruth, Ruth, if you need to plan, you know, your your self-care day to, to go to the beach alone or go on, on a jog alone, I encourage you to do that in advance with whoever you need to pre-plan that with. Um, or if you are alone, how do you pre-plan hanging out with someone you care about um, I know that plenty of people are getting vaccinated are feeling more comfortable hanging out with people. So how do you uh, pre-plan that? And I know I'm, you know, I, I'm going to a wedding not too far from now. And the requirement is to get a COVID um, a test 48 hours before. Um, so there's ways around feeling secure on how to um, hang out with people. Uh, especially if you want to do a picnic outdoor, things like that. Uh, it's a lot more accessible than even having this conversation with all of you last year. Um, I know we talked about reducing, um, you know, access to our computers, but if you, for whatever reason, are struggling with anxiety and are really fearful to be out in the community right now still, there are virtual outlets that there's like, on you know, online concerts nowadays. There's, um, I think I was, I, I shared this on one of my groups that you could do virtual tours. Like I pulled up Yosemite and it's so neat because you could actually hear people talking and then like the background of, of like the waterfalls. So you can even do like a virtual uh, tour that feels pretty real. Um, I mean, probably nothing like being there in person, but definitely helps hearing the sounds and feeling like, you know, it's a landscape of, of nature. Um, and I think all of us know that the accessibility and everybody functioning online, they've gotten so creative with how to, to stay connected to people. So um, looking, uh, looking up ways to, to hang out with others, basically, especially if they're not local um, or in San Diego to access. Um, I've already brushed a, a, a little bit on, on practicing mindfulness, um, but really what, what you could do to stay mindful and be in your moment is to um, get back to your five senses. It's as simple as that. We learn this in grade school, right? You know, what are your five senses? And we lose touch to it. That's kind of what happens with autopilot, right? Is like, I remember driving to Mesa and then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm already here. And it's because my mind was wandering, was thinking about maybe what I was gonna cook for dinner, what I was gonna do for, you know, what do I have planned for work? All of these things in my mind that it didn't allow me to be present with just driving. And how can you be present driving? You can observe the cars around you. So you could smell, um, maybe you had your breakfast in your car. Smell. That's all connected to, to your five senses. So even naming like the colors you see out of your window, it sounds silly, but that's how you get present in your moment. And even that distraction tip, could help you immediately with some of your anxious thoughts or feelings that you might already have. So it kind of, kind of disrupts it, but it doesn't disrupt it in a, in an avoidant way. It disrupts it in a, in a more mindful way. Um, let me catch up here. Yes, I will share the, the virtual um, link to the Yosemite one that I know for sure. Um, and then the last one here is create. So um, I think creating it can happen in any way. So whether it's a creative skill that you have, like woodworking or, um, you know, creating jewelry, 
or uh, painting, whatever way you want to create, whether it's a new skill or old skill, connect to that because that in itself is a form of reconnecting to who you are. Um, there's some people that I, I hear like, oh, I really like journaling, but you know, like I totally lost touch with journaling. Well, you can always pick it back up. You know, you can always re uh, reestablish the relationship with yourself and the things that you used to enjoy or the things that you want to enjoy. Uh, new hobbies are always positive uh, as long as they're healthy for you. Um, so that's that um, kind of perfect timing here. Uh, I just left the, the phone number to our office here if you have any questions for me and then my email address. Um, and then I also included student health services website um, as we do have events and, and groups um, that are accessible to students if you have anybody in mind that you feel like may need it. Um, and then all of you, if you are full time, obviously as, as uh, staff here at Mesa, you ha I believe you all have Viva, uh, which is, um, I don't know if it's through Optum Health. I can't really recall off the top of my head, but you all have EAP services that you can access um, to see a therapist. I think it's like three to five sessions for free. And then after that, you use your insurance and you have a copay maybe of some sort. But if you don't know, you are able to access mental health services through your health insurance. So if you have further questions, feel free to ask me, okay?